Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! I'm Dave Despain. Tonight on Wintel, we're going to wrap up our uh, on and off start and stop week with something a little different. We're going to talk to the guy who drives. Yeah. Perhaps the most famous monster truck in history, Grave Digger. Dennis Anderson is going to be taking your calls. Uh, 866-W-TUNNEL is the phone number. 866-988-6635. Emails reach us via the link over here at speedtv.com. We'll be talking 24 hours of Le Mans with Bob Barsha, who anchors the uh, Speed Channel exclusive coverage of the big race this weekend. Thursday night, that means we've got big three. Uh, we got some folks steamed up about the former South Dakota Governor Bill Janklo. There's a lot to do. There's only an hour to do it all, so what do you say we hit the to hot topics and get going here? The Canadian Grand Prix runs this weekend, and BAR teammates Jensen Button and Takuma Sato will have a new version of the Honda V10. The news there is that Honda intends to have a new version for every race from here on. They're taking these podium finishes very seriously. Speaking of podiums, Isle of Man with his junior TT win yesterday. John McGinnis went into the record book alongside legends Mike Halewood, Joey Dunlop, Steve Hislop, and David Jeffries, the only previous riders to score a three-win Island hat trick. And McGinnis has two more races, including the prestigious senior TT, to run tomorrow. And I'm uh, pretty impressed to learn that Shinya Nakano is going to ride this weekend's MotoGP round in Spain despite last Sunday's 170 mile an hour get off in Italy caused by a rear tire failure. Bridgestone says it's going to have some new ones for Catalonia. That's a good idea. At Le Mans, here are your class pole sitters. Two surprises. Yes, Johnny Herbert's Audi uh, has the pole, but the Zytec car, originally built for the LMP 675 class, qualified third. Split the four car Audi juggernaut. GTS. Ferrari nip Corvette for the pole, setting up what should be an exciting race in that class. Let's go on to the uh, Texas Motor Speedway uh, truck qualifying results. Ted Musgrave in a Dodge over Robert Huffman by a thousandth of a second, that tiny fraction of a mile an hour for the pole for tomorrow night's race, which you'll be seeing live here on Speed Channel. This is basically a huge weekend in racing. Next El Cup at Pocono, Bush Series at Nashville. Uh, IRL qualifying is just getting underway at Texas. We may have results of that before we leave the air. Got the NHRA at Columbus, Ohio, IHRA up in Canada. We mentioned MotoGP in Spain. The list goes on. There's something for every gearhead going on this weekend. Uh, okay, a question for you. How fast would the cup cars go at Talladega if they got rid of those darn restrictor plates? Well, we found out yesterday, and we have the exclusive video. Take a look at this. Here's how fast they go. Rusty Wallace hit 228 on the backstretch in a private test. That means the car didn't have to be legal. No, I'm not kidding. This is actual top secret exclusive video. Rusty says he just wanted to see what it feels like. He figured they'd be capable of 235, and if that happens, we're going to have to speed this video up. That's enough of that. I have to speed the video up up uh, even more. Uh, the more serious point, Wallace's quote. He says, there's no way that we could be out there racing at those speeds. Uh, it was neat to be out there running that fast by myself, but it would be insane to think that we could have a pack of cars out there doing that. Not that we're going to have to worry about it, I'm sure. Uh, though I am interested to talk to NASCAR's Gary Nelson about possible alternatives to the plate. He's never been a fan of restrictors. He's in the middle of developing the next generation NASCAR car. Where we're working on getting him on the show. I talked to him on the phone yesterday. He says he'll be able to do that probably in uh, July, not long. Stay tuned for that. And with that, let's say we go to the telephones and uh, get down to business here. Dominic is on the line from Boardman, Ohio. Welcome, Dominic. What's up? Hey, how's it going, Dave? Good. Uh, I was wondering, whatever happened to Jeff Stanton? Uh, the, last I heard, he was working with Honda. Is that true? And still is. He is a uh, coach, uh, essentially, for the uh, young riders on the uh, Honda motocross team. Um, you know, basically enjoying, I think, one of the perks uh, of uh, being a uh, factory rider who delivered all those championships for Honda back in the day. He wanted to keep his hand in, so he is, in fact, still a coach for the team. Line uh, five, I got Bob in Walworth, Wisconsin. Welcome, Bob. What's on your mind? Dave, right to the point. Uh, during the Coca-Cola 600, I, another vote for stinking race. Another vote uh, for what? Uh, for a stinking race. <laughs> okay, you thought that was boring. A lot of people right. did. But it overshadowed the race that was. Okay. The Bush race was a very interesting race, very good racing, mm -hmm. and for one reason. Okay, one what reason was that? only. After qualifying, we weren't bored to death from going around for happy hour because NASCAR uh, confiscated the cars. They couldn't touch them until the race. 
And you and think they ought to do that all the time? You bet you. You've got your race set up there for qualifying, and that's what you qualified with. Yeah. I fail to understand and have failed to understand for a very long time why they put so much focus on one lap of qualifying. If you make them qualify with their race set up on, it eliminates all that fuss of changing the car after you qualify it and, and get it ready for the race. I do not disagree with you. I think it could be a cost-cutting measure. I think it would make a good idea. And, and yeah, if you view that race as evidence of, uh, of how well it worked, hard to argue with the success of it. Uh, let's see. Well, I'll look back. Tuesday night in discussing the uh, Scott Wimmer case, I cited former South Dakota Governor Bill Janklow as evidence uh, that the criminal justice system doesn't necessarily treat everyone the same. Janklow blew a stop sign at 70 miles an hour, killed a motorcyclist. He was convicted of manslaughter, faced a possible 11 years in prison. The judge gave him three months. My bringing that up, uh, well, let's say it got some mixed reactions. <laughs> First of all, Dave, I was surprised to see you go off on Bill Janklo, but it's about time someone did. I feel he deserved much more of a sentence than he got, uh, and that he got off easy because of who he is. Cheryl in Phoenix, Arizona, that uh, was my whole point. On the other hand, Dave, I'm a South Dakotan and race car driver. The comparison you made between Scott Wimmer and Bill Janklo was pathetic. I'm offended that a person I see as an intelligent person who is highly savvy on his motorsports would insult my former governor. Until you learn up on the situation, stick to racing. The reason I tune into your show. Eric, I'm going to guess that it's pronounced Fuke. Uh, if somebody can learn me up uh, on this to the point that I feel different, Eric, I'm listening. Uh, you haven't succeeded in doing that. You argue that it's irrelevant, but I stand by my opinion. Scott Wimmer's DUI is in no way excused, but as miscarriages of justice go, his case is small potatoes when you compare it with Bill Janklow, which is what I did. Uh, okay, looking ahead, we've got uh, spectacular crushing of cars. That sounds like that ought to be interesting. We've got dizzying freestyle spins. Oh, yeah, they race these things, too. The creator and driver of the monster truck Grave Digger will join us shortly. And now that we know how they're going to be lining up for the 24 hours at Le Mans, we'll have the telecast host Bob Barsha checking in to tell us what to expect from this weekend's French Marathon. Hey, talk about history. Speed Channel proud to bring you exclusive coverage of this weekend's 72nd running of the 24 hours of Le Mans. The chase for one of racing's most prestigious podiums gets underway Saturday afternoon French time. Bob Barsha will anchor. And I talked to him earlier today about some of the things that we should be looking for this weekend. Let's give a listen. Well, Bob, we've heard all about the uh, potential Audi runaway, the fact that there are four cars here, ostensibly not factory team cars that are going to dominate it. And now we have this Zytec uh, sort of out of nowhere running as fast as the fast cars. Is that a real threat or is that a qualifying phenomenon? Dave, I think it's basically uh, David throwing stones at Goliath in qualifying. Uh, that Zytec was able to uh, stuff it to the Audis a little bit in qualifying, and that in itself is a, is a bit of a headline. That's how strong Audi is as a favorite at this year's race. Which Audi? Or, and does it matter? Well, in the past it never did because you had a true factory team in Reinhold Yost who's run this race and won it about as often as Roger Penske has won the Indianapolis 500. He is that good. These four Audis are identical equipment, all have terrific drivers. Eight of the 12 total Audi drivers have won this 24 hours of Le Mans before. So we have the prospect, at least, of those four teams really scratching at each other in a way that Audi-branded teams of the past have not been able to, and it should be a good race. Which brings us to what is always a good race and it's just such a legendary battle corvette versus ferrari how will that race shape up this year this this round well if qualifying is any example it's going to be close now when they came here for the one day test back in april corvette arrived with michelin tires for the first time and the step up in performance was huge they were nine seconds a lap faster and they basically left the ferraris in the dust but those were the pro-drive, care-racing Ferraris, and that team originally had not targeted the 24 Hours of Le Mans this year. They changed their mind, and they have come back. They are a very good team, and now all of those cars, Corvettes and Ferraris alike, are on Michelin tires, so they are very, very equally matched. There's a third Ferrari going up against the two Corvettes. That's from a third team called Larbra Competition, which used to run Dodge Vipers in endurance racing. So now we have three very well-run 550 Marinellos running against those two Corvette C5Rs. 
Last question, and I'm looking for your the 15 second version of a, something that you uh, milk for five minutes worth on your commentary page at SpeedTV.com. That's, <laughs> that's why uh, why you so enjoy this event and this form of racing. Well, I've always loved endurance racing, the whole team concept, the fact that it goes on for so long, and so many stories can evolve and change over time. Weather is a bigger bigger factor in this form of sport than than any other that I know of. But the, the biggest hook for me is the history. And, you know, we come to this place where they've been racing since 1923, all of the great names, all of the great American successes here, beginning with Phil Hill in the 50s, going through Dan Gurney and A.J. Foyt in 1967, Davy Jones, the most recent American to win the overall here. But that was back in 1996. So it's about time an American team did well. We've got 13 American drivers in the field. I don't think we're going to see Americans winning the overall but they could win some classes, and it, it's just a fabulous event, a real one-of-a-kind, and a must-see, I think, for anybody who really loves motorsports. Well, we'll be watching all weekend, so make us proud, will you? All right, Dave. Thanks a lot. Now, with that, a quick look at our Le Mans coverage schedule. We're going to start at 8.30 Eastern on uh, Saturday morning with a review of testing at 9 o'clock. Uh, highlights from qualifying, 9.30 Eastern on Saturday morning. We'll start cranking up for the actual start of the uh, Twice Around the Clock Classic. I hope you'll watch. Oh, by the way, win or lose, Corvette driver Ron Fellows will be here next Tuesday to give us his perspective on Le Mans. And uh, obviously, we hope he wins the thing because uh, that would just make it all that more interesting to have him on the show. James in Mooresville, North Carolina is on the line. James, what's on your mind? Uh, glad to have you back on tonight, Dave. Thank um, you. My, my comment is about Casey Mears. Um, he's done a heck of a turnaround this year. Um, mm -hmm. I know last year he did some Bush and some ARCA races to help him, but it really didn't do any good. Even though his um, past um, week wasn't too well, what do you think that turnaround is with all the top tens he's been having lately? What do I think is responsible for it? Correct. I mean, the whole team's doing better. Yeah, well, I mean, I think probably they're... It, it, I wonder if it's not the same syndrome as we're hearing about Michael Waltrip. Earnhardt throws out the hint that Michael may be looking for work. I think Casey coming into year two recognized, and certainly the team recognized, and I don't know whether this is, you know, where in the hierarchy this starts, but when you're not delivering results and you've actually been around the block once, it's time to step it up, and and it's not just the driver; it's the whole team. And I I can't tell you that uh, Chip Ganassi sent the memo out that said, "Come on, guys, you need to you make this happen." But Chip is an excellent manager of young talent, and I suspect that he conveyed not only to Casey but to the team that uh, they they needed to be better than they were last year. And lo and behold, they've gotten better. You're right. I mean, this this weekend was a, a bad example and a bit of a bum rap uh, for Casey, but uh, all in all, he is doing better and uh, justly proud of it. Uh, we need to take a quick break. We'll be back with your uh, your phone calls uh, right after this. Dennis Anderson and Gravedigger are just around the corner, so don't go anywhere. Wind tunnel off and rolling here on a Thursday night. We're glad to be back with you, too, although we hope you enjoyed the Isle of Man. All right, uh, tonight we're going to spend some time with a uh, pioneer of uh, motorized mayhem. Back uh, when he was just getting started, you didn't see monster trucks sailing 100 uh, feet through the air in front of sellout crowds every night. He goes way back to the year 1981 when he embarked on the uh, creation of the now legendary Grave Digger. And on any weekend, thousands of fans flock to see Dennis Anderson's creation trying to crush the competition, not to mention anything else that might lie in its path. We're going to talk about how far this phenomenon has come as uh, we welcome the driver of the Grave Digger to the show. Dennis, welcome. Nice to have you here tonight. Nice truck. Yeah, all right, man. Appreciate it. Sounds like it's raining outside. Hey, it is, man. It's coming down <laughs> cats and dogs down here in North Carolina right now. You can believe that. That is never a good thing for satellite signal. We'll keep our uh, fingers crossed. In the meantime, tell me a little bit about that truck. Uh, give me some of the stats. Uh, how high, what kind of wheelbase, weight, that sort of thing. Okay. Well, Grave Digger's a 1950 Chevy panel truck. It's all fiberglass now. It used to be steel, but I tore up every steel body within a 500-mile radius. <laughs> but it's, um, it, it weighs 10,000 pounds. The tires are 66 inches tall. They're 43 inches wide. The tires weigh like 700 pounds a piece. The whole truck weighs 10,000 pounds. Cool. We got a we got a 1,400 horsepower blown fuel injected alcohol motor. 
Got an awesome roll cage, awesome let, chassis. Let me stop you there. Kevin, go find the motor. I want to see where the motor is in that thing. You said 1,500 horsepower, Dennis, is that yeah, right? It's, uh, yeah, it's 1,400 horsepower. 1,400. See, yeah, and we're regulated by the uh, United States Hot Rod Association rules. Uh -huh. we, we can't run any bigger than an 871 blower, no more than 10% over on the blower for our boost. So it kind of regulates us. We honestly could get about 1,800 horsepower out of the motor, but uh, with those regulations, um, we can't. Uh, we get. We get all we can get. Fourteen thirty-five is the best we've got off the of dyno so far. I got you. So they actually regulate that. Those things look like they're unlimited, but you uh -oh, guys actually. There you go. Out. Get him. Get him stopped there. Just look right at me here, Dennis. So those things really do. You do really do have rules and regulations that you have to follow. I can't hear him. He's. No, that's not a good sign. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can you we hear me do. now, we Dennis. Have we yeah, have okay. rules and regulations that we have to follow, and um. There's a whole rule book, and when I first started in sport, we didn't even wear a helmet, you know. And it's uh, and the rules, safety rules, the whole element of monster trucking has just gone out of the roof, you know. It's it's awesome. How did you get started? How did you get started in monster trucks? Yeah, I trucks? started out mud bogging. I just I had an old truck, some junk that I put together with big rice and cane tractor tires on it, and um, and that's why I, that's why I named it Grave Digger. It was like I kind of drug the stuff out of the grave. And I told one of my old buddies one time that I'll dig you a grave. I'll take this old junk and dig you a grave. I took a spray bomb and sprayed on the side of the truck. And, um, and they had grave digger on the side of it. People loved it, man, from a long time ago. And it was nothing but pure junk. And um, <laughs> now I'm standing here on live TV. With, uh, with Grave Digger 19, the Roman numeral there on the, uh, on the hood, uh, there have been a lot of them along the way. We get this question a lot about, about monster trucks. It came in the form uh, of an email. Um, kid wants to know, how do I become a monster truck driver? Any, any tips for the kids who'd like to do what you've done, although I'm sure they'd like to start at the top rather than building their old junk and uh, working their way up the ladder? How do you become what you are? Well, I don't know. It's kind of hard to explain because I did start from junk. You know, so and when I started out, you could take $10,000 and you had a monster truck. All you had to do was buy a wore out uh, army truck, put big tires on it and a cab on it, and you basically had a monster truck. Nowadays, you have to have $150,000 to have a monster truck. And, if, um, and if, if somebody wanted to get into the sport, it's tough. You either have to have a really good business or win the lottery or something like that because once you get this thing done it takes a long time to build a name for itself yeah and you know buying uh, and us selling the novelties from the truck is what's made the truck my fans built this truck yeah. they built my whole empire you know and if you don't have a good name for your truck, you don't. You can't run that thing as hard as I run mine. It'll break you. We're going to talk a lot about how the sport's organized because it's changed a lot. But first, a very basic question that we heard a lot when Speed Channel first televised Monster Jam. A lot of folks loved it. A lot of racing purists were outraged. Dan DeFalco asked the key question in the form of an email. It says, some viewers may not be familiar with monster truck racing and have the idea that it isn't racing at all or a legit motorsport. I'm interested in your take on that. Uh, how about it? Dennis, legitimate motorsport in your mind? Hey, m most definitely. You know, it's a it's a motorsport that you know people think that it's rigged like some wrestling or whatever. You can believe one thing, buddy. Row. Whenever there is a grave digger monster truck on the track, this old boy don't back down for nothing. You don't rig my races. We earn our keep, and everybody out on that track does. And we do have a point series that we run. And um, and these guys are. There. I mean, they're fighting. And sometimes we don't have great big purses, but we have trophies and we got bragging rights. And we got pride, and um, and actually, our races are like shows. They're very unpredictable. You know, we're NASCAR racing. You know, we're going around and around. You might have a crash every once in a while. Monster truck race from round to round. You don't know if that thing's going to cartwheel, break a wheel off, or whatever. So, it's kind of a destruction sport, and uh, it's also a legitimate, you know, motorsport race. And um, I've been in it 22 years, so. We're not joking around with it. We need a break right here. We'll come back and talk more with Dennis Anderson. So far, so good with the satellite. We'll hope it holds up so that we can find out more about uh, who he is and what he does and uh, how his sport is organized because, as I said, that has changed a great deal in recent years. We'll get to that when we come back.
Check it out. AMA Motocross and Supercross star Ricky Carmichael, accustomed to jumping a Honda motorcycle with style and grace. Here's a little bit of a change of pace. He had the opportunity to blast around his practice track at the wheel of Gravedigger. And I'll tell you what, the guy, the guy did himself proud, catching some pretty good air right there. And that brings us back to a couple of questions for tonight's guest, Dennis Anderson. Dennis, it was Pablo Huffaker, not you, who was on hand to teach RC the tricks of the trade. Turns out there's more than one grave digger, more than one grave digger driver, and that's because this whole monster truck world has been revolutionized by Clear Channel Entertainment. For those who don't know, it's a huge conglomerate. They own radio stations, promotional rights to stadiums, concert venues. They promote Supercross, which is the Carmichael connection. You name it, they do it, and they own your truck. Tell me how that all works now. Okay, well, um, Clear Channel stepped in in 1999. And, uh, and we started a relationship. I'm still linked to the truck until I'm 94 or die first. And they were taking the sport to another level as far as entertainment, big crowds. We, you know, we're performing in front of uh, you know, 60 and 70,000 people at the big domes. And, um, and they've got it down, man. When it comes to promoting a show and getting people in, mm -hmm. you know, we've got the equipment. We just have to get the people there so they can see us run them. It's not just your truck. They've bought basically a fleet of the top trucks. Am I right about that? So they sort of own their own show. Is that the way it works? Right. And they're, they're, they, have, they still have independent uh, trucks that come into our races also. The stables right now, the Gravedigger, this is the, you know, Gravedigger is the, is the flagship of the whole gang right here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've got this, uh, we've got a, a big facility here for fabricating and building trucks and we've built 24 monster trucks here, built 32 blower motors, we've got our own engine room and all that and Clear Channel owns most of the nuts and bolts to the to the operation. And there are, there would be more than one grave digger truck then on a given night uh, or given weekend there might be two or three around the country with different drivers. Does that does that hurt your ego? Um, no, not really. I tell you what I'm more worried about is those other drivers satisfying the fans. And I just don't want the fans to be let down. And, you know, we can't help it a lot of times. We bust the truck up. But uh, the biggest thing is I don't like to get bad letters about my other drivers. And very seldom do I do, you know, but it's just some people are partial to me driving. I was the creator, been there 22 years. They'd rather see me at the race right. than, than some of the other drivers. But we do run seven grave diggers out there. You know, we've got seven different states going on on the weekends. And um, it's, it's a big business, man. We've, you know, we've, we've hung in here a long time with it. So explain how a night of competition is set up. We've seen the trucks doing a couple of different things here, uh, including right there getting hung up on the Jersey barrier. I'm not sure that was uh, part, of the, part of the plan. T tell me the two kinds of competition that you deal with here. Well, what we do is we have, a, um, we have drag race elimination. It's like side by side, and actually it's not just drag racing. There's obstacle courses. We have turning courses as well. And, um, and what you do is you pair all the trucks up and you end up with the fastest two guys at the end of the night. Once, uh, once you get done racing, then everybody always waits for freestyle. Freestyle is where you come out and strut your stuff, jump your truck, do the biggest wheelie, do the most awesome donut, run over school buses, whatever on the track. And, um, and people wait to see that because that's very unpredictable. They don't know if it's going to crash, crash and burn cartwheel, but um, people are stoked about freestyle. So the race is real competition, fastest guy wins. Freestyle is different in that it's a subjective kind of thing involving judging, and that's going to get us to a, uh, a little bit of a, of a controversy. What, um, who, who, who judges, first of all? Well, actually what they do is the United States Hot Rod Association, they've got a, they've got a staff that uh, sometimes they have volunteer judges that come in and they um, sometimes I don't think the, the judges are as fair as they ought to be because they honestly don't know what to judge on. You know, it's like, you know, for the most spectacular move and just because you go out and flip the truck and I'm the most flippingest guy on the circuit, but just because you go out and flip the truck, just, you know, at the beginning of the show doesn't mean that that guy should win. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we're going to really get a strong guideline on this year because I did file some complaints after the world finals and, um, and I was really upset with some of the judges. But there's a lot of judges out there, they're real fair. You know, I just don't want people to say, well, they just vote Gravedigger because Gravedigger's been there for a long time and everybody likes him. We want to earn or keep. They, we don't want nobody to cheat for us or give us anything. Let's, uh, in terms of the style of what people see, is it accurate that you 
How much credit do you take for creating the whole phenomenon of, of freestyle? I mean, weren't you the first guy to barely attach the body so that it would come flying off? Weren't you the first guy to uh, intentionally flip your truck because you knew it was good show business? Does, didn't that all sort of start with you? Well, it kind of did, but it wasn't, it wasn't exactly like that. I never, I never loosened my body, not unless I turned over and raced, and then we just zip-tied on so the body would fly off. But um, as far as having it rigged for freestyle, I did not go out and just run the truck as hard as it would. Freestyle actually started, when we started racing monster trucks, they, um, I'd come out and I'd be try to win like fastest qualifier. One run, and that's when I got my nickname years back, One Run Anderson. And I tried to win that. I tried to win the qualifying. It was an extra 750 bucks back then if you won qualifying. And a lot of times I'd bust it up in qualifying, and that was the end of seeing Gravedigger. So I'd tell the promoters, "Look, I'm gonna fix this thing and get it going. I want to come back, and I want to jump the cars and go do some crazy stuff. And I want to do a freestyle for my fans because they waited a long time to see me come a long ways, and I felt like I was letting them down." So the promoter's like, all right, whatever, get it going and get out here and, and jump and do your deal. So, and get it this really, out of your started system, freestyle. Right? <laughs> yeah, so now they make us do it. You know what I mean? It's like right. some guys, they just well, want to sure. race. People they don't it. want to freestyle. And they're like, well, thanks to you, we have to freestyle now. <laughs> all right, I need to get a commercial break in here. Uh, hang with me, Dennis. We'll be right back. If you want to see uh, Grave Digger in action, here's where you can catch some of the uh, upcoming episodes of Monster Jam. And that will be here on Speed Channel. So there's a lot more of this for you to enjoy. We'll come back and talk more more with Dennis Anderson right after this. See if you detect the theme here. Celebrity monster truck drivers. That is Kevin Harvick with a specially painted monster truck, which is using to crush his wife's aunt's car, which seems like a pretty rotten thing to do. But the reason that he's doing that is because, because he bought his wife's aunt a new car. So there you go. And speaking of uh, Harvick and Richard Childress Racing, is it uh, true, Dennis Anderson, that you were a big Dale Earnhardt fan and meeting him was one of the big thrills in your monster truck career? Yeah, it most definitely was, man. I used to, um, I'd done just a few things that Dale was around. And, he, and what I liked about Dale was, it was he was a good all-American country boy. And he used to always make it a point to come by and make a comment to me. You know, either call me the wild man, the crazy dude, whatever. <laughs> And um, it was pretty cool because we were doing this one shot in Charlotte where we had a team come over the wall and I come flying into pit road and they're going to, you know, change the tires and all that stuff. And I was actually asleep at the wheel waiting for the camera crews, you know, and we had a long night and, um, and he come by and slapped on my door and woke me up. And that was the last time I saw Dale. But, yeah, man, he's I've always been a number one fan of him. Let's uh, get the viewers involved here. I got Kale in South Boston, Massachusetts for uh, for Dennis. Go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for taking the call, Dave. Dennis, I'm wondering, I see the nitro shocks there on Gravedigger 19. I was wondering about the coilovers you had earlier in the year. Um, you ran them one race, wrecked, and we haven't seen them since. Uh, what were the problems with them, and will we see coilover shocks on Digger 19 again? Yeah, we'll see them on there again, because uh, what we want to do is I came out with a brand new truck, a basket full of bugs. We had this, the, uh, and it wasn't new to us. It was old school coilover shocks. And yes, they will work. We just didn't have, um, we didn't have a rebound right and we didn't have the spring tension right. The springs are not, uh, uh, you know, we couldn't grab them right off the shelf. It's a custom made uh, spring and we didn't, um, and we just didn't have, we didn't have the time or the finances right then building a brand new truck to have a coil spring setting around. But yeah, to answer your question, we've got them hanging on a rack right over here in the shop. And when I get to West Lebanon and a couple other outdoor tracks, we're going to test the shocks and we're going to compare them with the gas shocks. And, um, and right now I'm favoring the, the nitrogen shocks that I'm running, but the coilovers will take great big air and the truck is a lot more stable with them. How much travel are we talking about on the, on the shock package on the truck? The, we've got 26 inches on the, uh, on the shock and um, some of our shocks we have 30 inches on them. Wow. I prefer running a 26 inch shock on the back and actually I run 26s all the way around on this truck. And um, you know, we do occasionally throw a 30 inch on the back. So we have a lot of drop out you know, on the suspension as you're jumping, keep those back wheels on the ground. Let's go to, uh, let's go to Angela up in Iowa. You're on the phone with uh, Dennis Anderson. Go ahead. Hi, Dennis. Congratulations on your world finals racing win in Vegas. Uh, I, can you I hear see... Dennis? I can hear him. Can you hear me, Dennis? Okay, yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, we got you, Angela. Go ahead. 
Hi, Dennis. I want to congratulate you on your World Finals racing win in, in Vegas. And I see Tom Mintz is always on your heels to get the win. My question is, are there any hard feelings between you and Tom Mintz, or are you good friends? No, we're friends. Tom, um, Tom wants to win just as bad as I do, but, um, you know, we talk a little smack when we're out there on the track. And we do have attitudes with each other when we're racing. But off the track, man, he knows we all came from the same place. We started with nothing and pure junk. So that's why we're, uh, we're two in a life. And um, I don't have a problem with him. I didn't like the Goldberg truck. I didn't like Goldberg and the Goldberg truck. But Tom Mintz, I like Tom Mintz. What about, uh, what about Bigfoot? That used to be the big rivalry. Gravedigger and Bigfoot, are they just not part of the Clear Channel plan? Is that why we don't see them out there? That He's off doing his own thing? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, but as far as Bigfoot goes, man, I love Bigfoot. I mean, Bob Chandler, he was the man. I used to, he, I used to stay over here, lived on the East Coast. I wanted to race him, tug of war him, do something with his truck and my truck so bad for so long that um, Bigfoot is a big part of why I'm actually, my career went on. I chased Bob Chandler, Jimmy Kramer, and you know, the, all some of the old drivers. And um, he just, he doesn't race with us. I do race with him in some of the summer heat races out, you know, out in California and some of our jamborees. I still run with them. And those boys scared, they're scared of the grave digger now, Buddy Rogers. <laughs> they, well, they used to, they used to spank me all the time. Now when they, when I'm at the track, they sweat me. They sweat my truck and they sweat me. One more quick one from Dan in Blooming Grove, New York. Go ahead, Dan. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dennis. How you guys doing tonight? Good, man. All right. Uh, Dennis, I heard some talk about your son Adam going to be driving a monster truck soon. You know when that's going to be? Um, actually, we kind of put his project on the back burner, and we still we still got it going on. We've got the chassis built. We're working on some differentials and stuff like that. And um, and we just had we had a big gap in some little problems that we had going on. We had to wait till he was 18 years old. He just turned 18 years old. He just graduated from high school, and it's a big decision to make. We don't want to jump out there and throw a couple hundred thousand dollars in this new son of a digger race truck, and that's not it's not going to be him. We're going to stick him in something as our game plan and see how he likes it. I've already tested him in the field. He's got the throttle rhythm, and he's going to be a good driver. Uh, we just don't know what he's going to be like, um, you know, on the track in front of the people and stuff like that. So we're kind of tiptoeing, but yeah, the son of a digger thing is still boiling. So the son of a digger will continue uh, into the next generation, perhaps. In the meantime, the thunder booming in the background has probably our cue to get you guys off the satellite before you all get electrocuted. Dennis, thank you very much. We appreciate you taking time to chat with us. Tell us about monster trucks tonight. All right, man. Thank you, guys. All right. We appreciate that. All right. It's Thursday. That means the traditional big three. And with Lamar running this weekend, we opted for examples of that event's influence throughout the world of motorsport for the big three. We have, for example, your Le Mans start, emulated in a wide variety of disciplines before it was dumped at its very birthplace. Something about guys blasting down the Molson straight at warp speed for the first time while still trying to get their belts all buckled. Not a good idea. And then there was Dan Gurney's famous win, after which he created the most universal of all motorsports traditions. Believe it or not, this was the very first time anybody sprayed the champagne. Now, before the show, and before we show you the third one, true confessions, we had this really long debate in the meeting this morning whether to do the big three Le Mans moments or the big three monster truck moments, and so we decided we'll compromise and we'll have a Le Monster moment. There you go. Remember, we only have fun with this because Mercedes driver Peter Dumbreck walked away from this amazing flip. And the judges say <laughs> a controversial 20 now. All right, with that, a quick commercial break, and then we're going to move on to the uh, lack of racing coverage in some local newspapers and, of course, the all-important update from Queen City Speedway in Mississippi. Don't go anywhere. You're going to want to hear this or not. Shanghai, China officially opened its Formula One circuit this week. Former Ferrari driver Gerhard Berger had the honor of uh, breaking in the venue. Lots of folks there just to watch the grand opening. He was in Michael Schumacher's title-winning 03 car. The first ever Grand Prix of China takes place on September the 26th. 
On the immediate horizon, of course, would be this weekend's Canadian Grand Prix, which was on and off of the calendar because of that whole business with the tobacco advertising saved at the last minute so that you can see it here this weekend and you don't have to get up in the middle of the night to do that. Friday practice, 2 p.m. Eastern time, qualifying 1 p.m. on Saturday. The race is at noon on Sunday. And then they're off to Indy for the U.S. Grand Prix coming up next weekend. Let's go to the phones. John in Tampa, Florida. Go ahead. Hey, Dave. I know you're busy on all these fast as I can. Three okay. questions. Three uh, questions? Yeah, real fast. They all flowing together. Number one, ballpark, how much does it, run, does it cost to run Hooters just broke up a year? Number two, I noticed that a lot of people and a lot of people are really successful in Hooters Pro Cup are really older gentlemen, like the late, early 40s, almost 50s. Number three, if I was to get to the Hooters Pro Cup through hard work, saving my money, and having a career in my own business, at a young age, if I was, like, say, 27, 28, and I was dominating Hooters Pro Cup, I mean, season after season, dominating wins, is that a way to actually step up to Arca and Bush and finally lead a cup? I don't know the budget for a Hooters uh, division uh, effort for a season. Uh, I'd be absolutely guessing uh, at that number, so I'm sorry I can't help you with that one. Yeah, there are a fair number. of uh, Hooters Cup seems to me has this big spread. You've got a bunch of veterans that have seen, you know, the the uh, – what should I say? They're, they're, they're past the peak of their career, I guess would be the appropriate way to say it. Not that they still can't drive race cars and win races, as we see very often. And then you've got a bunch of kids on their way up. Is Hooters a good uh, stepping stone to cup, I guess was your third question. I would offer you a couple of names. Uh, Brian Vickers, for one. I mean, there's a guy who was in a cup car by the time he was 20, what, 19, when he first started his first cup or something like that. Came right out of Hooters. And the other, of course, is Matt Kenseth, who uh, used that as a stepping stone to the championship. So I uh, don't know the answer to how much it'll cost you, but if you can raise the money and put that deal together and go out and win a bunch of races in the Hooters uh, Pro Cup, absolutely, that could be a stepping stone to wherever it is you want to go in stock car racing. Uh, and on that note, I think we need a commercial break. We will take that right now. We will come back on the other side and uh, have more of your phone calls and uh, the promised update from Queen City Speedway. Oh, look, it's Dave Digger. All right, no more of this uh, Isle of Man slacking. Next week on Wind Tunnel, Monday night, a guy who could talk bikes, sports cars, rally, Formula One, head of competition for Michelin tires, Pierre DePastier. On Tuesday, Ron Fellows is hoping his Michelins take him to the class win at Le Mans. Wednesday, we're working on Thursday, F1 team owner Eddie Jordan and Toyota F1 driver Olivier Panis, both live from Indianapolis. Let's go to the phones. We've got uh, Bert in Ontario, Canada. Bert, welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hi, how are you, Dave? Good. I just want to get your uh, thoughts on uh, Le Mans this weekend and also the way Audi is dominating uh, the ALMS series now. Do you think that's a bad thing for the future of the series? Because it kind of reminds me of back in the old days of Can Am when McLaren and that dominated and everybody else sort of just packed up and went home. Yeah. Well, it can certainly work that way, but I think by the same token, when you think in terms of endurance sports car racing, you gotta you got to think of Porsche and all the years that they've dominated or, or, or did dominate right. at Le Mans and uh, certainly in, uh, in the old IMSA series. And it, it, we've, we've talked about this in a variety of different uh, forms of motorsports. Factories come, factories go. It's always about their priorities. It's not necessarily about the long-term welfare of the series. I think it would certainly be healthier for uh, ALMS and for Le Mans at the present time if they had more brands in there. But unless other brands are prioritizing that form of competition to sell cars, it's not going to happen. Um, long term, my guess is that the wheel will revolve and those guys, some guys, will be back at some point in the future. Do you find it less interesting to watch because there's only one brand out there? Uh, I think Bert has. You still there, Bert? Oh, I, I, I enjoy it all the way. I, I think it's great. I just wish, that, like you say, that there was more brands. I've heard that uh, Mazda might be coming back. I hear the reps are down at Le Mans this weekend taking a serious look at the series. That, 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 that rumor is uh, prominent. We know they're there. We don't know how close they are to, uh, to doing the business, but uh, yeah. love to have them. Appreciate the call, Bert, up in Ontario. Uh, we move on. A lot of things have changed in the 30 years I've been working in the racing business in one form or another. For one thing, this is a complaint I don't hear quite as often. But as you're about to see, it's still out there. Email says, Dave, how much does print media 
media, mostly newspapers, tell of the popularity of racing. I live in Burbank. Local major newspaper only has little AP articles about racing. Does that say something about what the people here are interested in or what? I know that I should take this gripe to the local newspaper. All I can say is that Speed TV is a race fan's dream. KL in uh, Burbank, California. We run that not because it's self-serving, but to make the point, you should let your newspaper know how you feel, KL. Uh, and here's why. TV has a rating system. Imperfect though it may be, we have this gauge that tells us every 15 minutes how many people are watching. It measures program by program what does and does not attract an audience. Thus, it measures interest in the subject matter. Newspapers don't have a system like that to judge article by article who reads what. So sports editors have to use their own best judgment to decide what sports it is that people care about. And sports editors come from an education system here in America that basically emphasizes and subsidizes three sports, the big three, football, basketball, baseball. Those are the games that these people know, so it's logical that that's the ones they're going to be inclined to cover. The answer to your question is no. I don't think newspaper coverage is an accurate measure of racing popularity. Uh, okay, um, you know, you all know how much I love it when we inspire somebody to go check out their local racetrack. Well, we were just double pleased to learn that Daniel Switzer in Meridian, Mississippi, uh, went to uh, Queen City Raceway and was so pumped up by the action that he bought a season ticket. We were a little less thrilled uh, <laughs> when this guy and his buddies called the viewer voicemail with a trackside update, perhaps after a couple trips to the concession stand. Give a listen. Tell me what you think. We're out here at the Queen City Raceway dirt track for the late models. They're going to fist to go on the great state race. Stay raised. We wanted to call you and let you know that we can get some. This is David. We're on the uh, hey, off the day. Around. Hey, David, you want to see some real racing? Just come on down here to Queen City Speedway, buddy. Love your shirt. <laughs> Love your shirt, man. Love your shirt. the hog on those boys right now. Get them. They had good intentions. They actually called several times with the notion that they were going to hold up the phone so that we could hear the cars run, which was kind of a nice idea. Problem is, they always called under yellow, so we could never hear the cars cars run. All they managed to get was a Fram Airhog Award. Thanks anyway, guys. We need to take a break. We'll come back on the other side. Wind Tunnel with Dave Despain is brought to you by... We got it. Oh, okay, we'll hurry. Uh, we continue to get responses to my take that was entitled, You Can't Get Hurt in a Crash That Never Happens. It's been moved to the archives of the commentary page at speedtv.com. It's dated May 20th, if you want to read it. This may be the final word on the subject. It comes from a guy named Skip Tallman. A woman in a Cadillac doing 65 with her face in a rearview mirror, putting on her eyeliner, veered halfway over into my lane. Scared me so much, I dropped my electric shaver, which knocked the donut out of my other hand, trying to straighten out the car using my knee against the steering wheel. I knocked my cell phone away from my ear. It fell in my coffee between my legs, splashed and burned Big Jim and the twins, ruined the phone, soaked my trousers, and disconnected an important call. Damn women drivers. Point taken, Skip. Uh, you folks not paying attention to your driving darn well know who you are, so shape up out there, all right? And with that, I'll just bet you. Yeah, there we go. There's the little guy who says last call, and last call for tonight is going to go all the way out to Grass Valley, California. Vicky's on the line. Vicky, what's on your mind tonight? What's on my mind? NASCAR is anything but boring. Okay. I watch it seven days a week. I am the biggest NASCAR fan. Okay. Last week, you said you get your knowledge because you watch Speed News, Speed News NASCAR Edition, and Speed News Sunday. That's it. Well, let me tell you, I watch all the truck races, bush race, cup race. I watch cup qualifying, happy hour, totally NASCAR, victory lane, inside Nextel Cup. Trackside, NASCAR Driver 360, NASCAR This Morning, Speed News NASCAR Edition, NASCAR Live, and, of course, Wind Tunnel with Dave Despain. Also, okay. <laughs> I have a NASCAR room in my house that probably needs a bobblehead in it. People call it my <laughs> Earnhardt Shrine, but I call it a NASCAR room. Can we do the air hog twice in one show? I don't know what the rules are about that. Anyway, Vicki, what's your point? You watch a lot of NASCAR. You like a lot of NASCAR. You're yes, the kind of person that works I have loves. a question for you. I don't think you'll be able to give me the answer. Okay. Because with all of my watching, I haven't got it. Why does DW call Junior June Bug? Uh, it's a nickname that uh, his dad and Yuri gave him when he was a little bitty kid. They, he was always coming around bugging him, and so they called him Junebug when he was oh. like this high. So that's the. Re I'm surprised you haven't heard them explain that on one of those multitude no, of television read, I mean, shows. I read books. I've read Larry McReynolds, uh, Junior, Vicky, everybody. Vicky, stop. The show's over. Thank you for calling. We appreciate it. I think Vicky's a fan. Uh, Dario Franchitti's on the pole in Texas for the IRL race. Buddy Race is second. They just finished qualifying.
qualifying. Honda got the top five spots. Tony Stewart's going to drive the Paul Revere 250 uh, Rolex sports car race in Daytona. Tell me when we're out of town. Yes, the Italian GP was the best MotoGP race I've ever seen. They'll have another one in Spain this weekend. I'm Dave Spain. Maybe we'll talk about that on Monday night.